What's up, everyone? Welcome to DockerCon 2021. I'm excited to be a part of this conference again. And this year, I'm going to be speaking to you about Docker Swarm in AWS. And if you're familiar with AWS and Docker Swarm, then you know that there's no native platform support for it at this particular point in time. And so you may be part of a team or working for a company that wants to opt for this solution, but you haven't quite figured out how to piece the relevant components together. And so that's the reason why Calvin Parati and I will be taking you through this talk. It'll be very hands-on in the sense that we will take you through the relevant code, as well as a demonstration of a microservice application at the end of it. As a way of introduction, I'm going to start by introducing myself and my co-presenter. Uh, both of us work at Intellect Software. Calvin Parati and I are both software engineers, and we work in the same team at Standard Bank South Africa, where we consult in the cloud and DevOps space. In case you're wondering what we're going to cover in this talk, I'm going to start off with elaborating on the problem of managing multiple containers in a production environment, especially if that can scale up to thousands of containers. You want an automated way of actually managing all of those containers, and that's what a container orchestration tool does for you. And so we'll look at that in detail, and that'll segue into running Docker Swarm in an AWS environment. As I mentioned earlier, this isn't something that is natively supported by AWS. And so uh, we'll be looking at how to set that up. And I'll just mention a few of the components without going into too much detail, because Calvin will cover that later. And after that, he's then going to take you through a bird's eye view of the entire architecture. And Calvin will show you all the networking components that you need to consider and how you need to set up your EC2 instances, as well as looking at some of the details when it comes to how to initialize your cluster as well. Going on from there, we're going to also look at some of the Terraform source code that is used to build up all the infrastructure because we won't be doing this manually. And that's another thing that Calvin will be taking you through. And we'll cap it off with a demo uh, by deploying a microservice application. And all of, this, all of the source code for this entire talk will actually be available on a GitHub repository, so you'll be able to make use of it. Companies with sizable workloads in production could end up running up to thousands of containers over time. And these containers need to be deployed, they need to be managed, connected, and updated. Now, with a few containers, this might seem achievable in a manual kind of way, but a large enterprise application in the cloud would require an entire team dedicated to managing this. Uh, that overhead is probably something you don't want to be dealing with. It's the same problem that actually gave room for tools like Docker Swarm. As great as they are, it's not enough to containerize your applications if you don't really have a system that enables you to automatically fulfill things like deploying of images and containers, integrating and orchestrating different modular parts in the cluster, managing the scaling of containers and clusters based on demand, uh, resource balancing in containers and clusters, uh, providing communication across a cluster, traffic management for services, uh, etc. Containers, unfortunately, don't inherently accomplish all of this for you. They are merely pieces that require a crane to fulfill the orchestration responsibilities. And container orchestration takes care of the automation of the scheduling, deployment, uh, networking, scaling, health monitoring, and management of your containers. If you've ever tried to man manually scale your deployments just to maximize on efficiency or secure your applications consistently across platforms, then you've probably already experienced many of the pains that a container orchestration platform can help solve. Entree Docker Swarm. Some of you may be completely new to Docker Swarm and trying to understand a little bit better how the architecture actually works. It's essentially a group of physical or virtual machines, in this case EC2 instances, and they operate as a cluster. So if a machine was to join that cluster, then it would be a node inside of the swarm. And Docker Swarm recognizes uh, three types of nodes. There is the manager node, the leader node, and the worker node, and they each fulfill a specific role in the ecosystem. The main function of the manager node is to assign tasks to the worker nodes, and it also carries out managerial tasks to operate the swarm as a whole. Once a cluster is established, a leader node will be assigned, and the leader node is responsible for the task orchestration and the management for the swarm as a whole. In the case of any kind of failure or outage, and that leader node is longer available, a new node will be assigned as the new leader node. Lastly, we have worker nodes that are hosts on the cluster that receive and execute tasks from the manager node that allocates them accordingly. 
And by default, manager nodes are also worker nodes, and they're capable of executing tasks as well if they have the resources available to do so. Thanks, Luke. Hi, everyone. As Luke said, I'm Calvin, and I'm excited to be here. So let's start our journey of getting Swarm to the cloud. Starting off with a bird's eye view of architecture, we can see we have a simple VPC. Inside the VPC, we have three availability zones for fault tolerance. These three availability zones each house two subnets, one public and one private. The private subnets are used to house each student instances where the Swarm cluster will live. In the public subnet, we have a NAT gateway, which will allow instances to communicate to the internet and for them to download Docker and third party dependencies. We also have a network load balancer that will forward public facing traffic to our Swarm. It's worth mentioning that because our instance is on a private subnet, we can't simply SSH into it, unless we deploy a bastion host in our, in our public subnet and do SSH forwarding, or we create a VPN to our VPC. But luckily, with SSM and AWS, we can easily access our EC2 instances via the console or the CLI. Now let's take a deeper look into our network ingress. As you can see, we have a public facing load balancer that receives traffic from the users. This NLB will forward traffic to our work instances. Our instances that are sitting in a private subnet each have an elastic IP address attached to them. The load balancer will forward the traffic on these IP addresses. Once the traffic hits the nodes, this is where the swarm routing mesh takes over. And it's important to note that regardless of where your container sits, by default, the Swarm exposes that service on that node on all of the worker nodes in the Swarm. So for example, if we deployed container in node 3 on port 3002, node 1 and node 2 will also be exposed in port 3002. And any of the nodes can receive the traffic and the Swarm writing mesh will forward the traffic to the correct container. Now that we had a bird's eye view of the infrastructure that we're deploying and a deeper look at how the English traffic will work, it's time to look at the code that powers this. We'll be using Terraform to deploy infrastructure and cloud in it to provision our EC2 instances into either a manager or worker node. Our Terraform is divided into two main folders, a live and a module folder. The module folder contains the main components needed in infrastructure and the live folder to bring these components together to deploy our unique Swarm environment. Taking a look at the main tier folder, in our live folder, we can start to see the configurations needed for our Swarm cluster. Starting with the network, we can see our starter range is slash 16, meaning we have over 65,000 unique IP addresses. This might be an overkill for our Swarm cluster, but like I always say, if you don't have any IP constraints, the more the better. Then we have to divide our VPC into three private and three public subnets. Our next module is the IAM module, and this is simply the IAM instance profile that we attach to every EC2 instance, enabling us to use SSM to connect to our instances. From there, we have the security groups. In our case, we have a single security group that will be attached to every EC2 instance, but you could create a separate security group for your manager and worker nodes. The inbound rules for our security groups are defined in our local.tf file. And as you can see, we've opened up all the ports needed by the Swarm manager to distribute work to the workers and for the workers to communicate to the manager. We've also opened up port 3002, and this is for the network load balancer to forward traffic to the GraphQL microservice. Lastly, we've also opened up port 443, and this is purely to allow us to connect our instances via SSM. Moving back to the main.tf file, we start to provision the EC2 instances needed for our Swarm cluster. We start off with the initial manager. And the reason is we have a separate module for initial manager is as this is the easy to instance that will run swarm in it and therefore it needs to be deployed first. The other managers and nodes come after this and they'll simply run swarm join. We started to define the number of instances we want. Because this is the initial manager, we'll always want one. From there, we define the easy to instance type we want and give it a name. We also attach the IAM profile that was created above and place the instance into a subnet as well as giving it a private IP address. The user data is the data to provision the EC2 instance that boot up, and we'll get into this more a bit later. Moving on to additional managers. The additional managers are defined by the number of managers in a variable we define our local TF, minus one due to the initial manager also counting as a manager. The rest of the configs are the exact same as a manager, giving an IP address, a subnet, attaching the profile name, and user data. 
Then we have our nodes, which is the similar configuration to our manager and our initial manager. We simply define the name for name of it, instance type, the IP addresses, the number of nodes we want, and so forth. And as you can see, both the manager and the nodes both have this depends on the initial manager. And this is to, is in to ensure that the managers and the nodes get deployed after the initial manager and therefore ensuring that the swarm init has run before these nodes run swarm join in their boot up process. To automate the initial configurations and dependencies for each EC2 instance, we use CloudUnit. CloudUnit is the industry standard cloud instance initialization plugin. It is a simple YAML file that is given to each EC2 instance at boot up and runs the required configurations. Because we're using Ubuntu for each EC2 instance, we can simply use the apt get to add any additional repositories. As seen here, we're adding the Docker app repository to download and install the latest version of Docker. Along with Docker, we're installing some other packages, such as curl, unzipped, and jq, and these come from the default and pre-installed app repositories. Then we have our first conditional parameter. If a, if a variable initial manager equals true, then write the file. So this is simply writing a docker compose file to initial manager EC2 instance. The reason we're doing this is so we can run docker stack deploy on this docker compose file. Ideally, you'd use some sort of CICD tool to do this or some third party um, provisioning software for this such as Chef or Puppet. But for today's purposes, we're simply gonna write the file to the initial manager and run docker stack deploy. From there, we have our run CMD commands. And these are simple commands that will run at boot up for each EC2 instance. Again, we have some additional parameters before each command. Essentially, if the parameter, if the variable equals the correct um, variable, if the boolean is true, then this line will be added to the client net config. For the initial manager, we'll run swarm in net on, and expose it on the initial manager IP address. Then we'll, we'll on the, on the initial manager again, we'll take the worker join and the manager join tokens and save these tokens in secret manager. The reason we do this is so that the other nodes can grab these tokens from secret manager and join the, the, the swarm cluster. Finally, we run docker stack deploy on that compose file that we had written previously. Then for any new manager or any worker, it will simply run docker swarm join and retrieve the join token from Secret Manager. You might be wondering where these conditional parameter variables in our client configurations are defined. These are defined in our data.tf file. As you can see, we have one for initial manager, manager, and nodes. Each of these reference our cloud init YAML file and pass in the variables for the conditional parameters. It passes in the initial parameter ID. If it's initial manager, it's a worker, false for initial manager, and new manager, um, false. Simply for managers, it's not the initial manager, it's not a worker, but it is a new manager. And for nodes, it's not the initial manager, it's, it is a worker, and it's not a new manager. There's one additional one for the initial manager, and this is the doc compose file in base64, and this is just retrieving the base64 version the docker compose file that is sitting in our microservice folder. These data fields are then passed to our EC2 instance modules under user data, and they just reference the initial ones for each of their unique names, and then they are rendered, and that's how the, the client need is getting added to each EC2 instance. It is important to note that we're trying to keep all our nodes like cattle and not like pet. So even though our initial manager has slightly different cloud in net configs and has additional cloud uh, file added to it, these are the only differences within our instances. And after initial boot up, our initial manager can be removed and other masters will take over and the additional masters can be added throughout the life cycle of this cluster. The last module required is a network load balancer. And this is the one that forwards public traffic to our private EC2 instances. We simply give it a name, 
a target group port that will be it will be listening on publicly port 80 we could make it port 443 and configure a cert and a dns to it but for today it'll just be port 80 and then where to route the traffic to so the ip address this will be the ip addresses of our ec2 worker nodes and and those will be exposed on port 3, 3002 and this is because our graphql server has been published through docker swarm on port 3002 and wherever the swarm is wherever the graphql server is running due to the swarm load balancer it will find the correct container now that we've seen all the resources needed for our swarm environment let's deploy first looking at our local tf file our con current configurations are number of managers one number of nodes two the initial ip address of our initial manager is 10.0.1.5 and this will be used by the nodes to join the swarm Due to the power of Terraform depends on, and Terraform knowing which modules resources to deploy first, we'll be ensured that the correct resources are deployed in the right order and our environment will come up correctly. Deploying our environment is like any other Terraform module, in Terraform Apply. This will deploy all our current VPCs, subnets, EC2 instances, NAT gateways, and more. Now that, now that the Terraform is deployed, let's see what happened. Looking at the AWS console, we can see we have four EC2 instances, three swarm nodes, and one initial manager. Once all the status checks are verified, we can now SSM into our initial manager. Using the SSM CLI, I'm SSM into our initial manager node, and I'm just ensuring that the state of the node is running. Once I'm inside the node, I can verify that the client init script has worked by checking if the nodes join the cluster. And indeed they did. We have three worker nodes. The initial manager is drained, and this is because we don't want to run any tasks on our initial manager, because managers can also be workers themselves. Verifying that the services are deployed correctly as well, we can see we have our three microservices, each with three replicas. All right, now that we have done a code walkthrough um, and shown you the different resources that need to be created in Terraform, um, as well as actually deploy that infrastructure, and we've seen that our environment is up and running and the application is um, is working as expected um, with the relevant number of replicas in terms of the services that we've spun up, um, and our swarm, which is the most important component over here, is actually functioning as it should be. And Calvin took you through all of that. And what I want to do a, uh, at this point is a quick jet tour of the microservice application that has actually been deployed. Now, because this is not a core part of what we're actually doing, um, I will just focus on specific pieces of the code just to help you better wrap your head around what is going on over there. And so it lives inside of this folder over here in the repository called microservices. And we have three services. Um, we have the GraphQL, BFF, uh, orders, and products. This fourth folder over here, Postman Collection, just um, contains the an exported version of the API requests to test out um, each one of these services. So you can go ahead and import that in your uh, Postman locally so you can test it out as well. And so these three services are essentially trying to mimic somewhat of an e-commerce system, as, as you probably all already guessed with orders and products. And GraphQL is working as a backend for front end, somewhat of an API gateway through to those different services so that we can re request specific data. And so um, apart from that, at the root level as well of the microservices folder, we have this Docker Compose YAML file, which is a very important piece because the Docker Compose YAML file is what is actually being used to deploy our stack on the swarm. And so I will go over that last once I've taken you through specific parts of these um, three services. So I'll start off with products, and I'm going to open the controller over here, and I'm also going to open the roots. Um, <clears throat> And so with the roots over here, you can see I'm defining uh, two roots. We've got uh, products and products to fetch a specific ID, both of them being get requests. And as you'll notice over here, they are tied to specific controller functions. And so if I head over to uh, product uh, controller, you'll see that we're actually not connecting to a database. Instead, I've just created uh, an array, which is 
functioning like our database. And so um, we've only got two product items. And so this is what we're going to return when the get request is made. And if we want to get a specific product item, it will fetch it based on the parameter that is added um, to the request and get um, the relevant product using the ID and return that um, to the client that makes the request. Okay, so that is the product service in a nutshell. And um, next up, I'm going to show you the orders service, which isn't really different in terms of structure, and it only has one root. Let me collapse that over there. As you can see, we only we fetch orders. And then when I go to the orders controller, you can see that we have two orders uh, for two different people. And these product IDs that have been placed over here are tied to specific products that exist in that array, which is functioning like our DB in this particular case. And last but not least is the GraphQL um, service. And so I'm going to start by showing you the root query type. And as you know, when you're using Docker Compose, it takes care of all of the networking under the hood for you. And um, resolves the relevant um, DNS names as well. So you would simply have to put in the name of the service that you define in Docker Compose and it'll be able to resolve it. And so this is my root query over here, my root query type, and I make sure that I can I have the order field of the orders field over here, which will be able to fetch all the orders from my orders service um, API. And I do the same thing with products. And now because I do want to be able to particularly um, fetch specific data as well. When I make a query with either orders or products, I define specific types in here, order and product. I'm going to collapse and close that one over there. And you can see our product type over here. We'll simply return um, the ID of the product and the name of the product. And um, in the case of the order, you'll see the order type over here. We can get the order ID as well as get some product details um, for that particular order that we have, and we can get some nice nested data, um, as you would expect. Um, this is one of the, th the things that makes GraphQL so cool, and we'll take a look at that shortly when we're going over uh, the demo. All right, and so those are our services in a nutshell. And lastly, take a look at the Docker Compose YAML file, a very central component. And so you can see right at the top over there is the version of uh, Docker Compose that uh, for this particular type of file that we're using. I'm using version 3.9, which I think at this point in time is the latest version. And um, this is just a configuration file to define how you want your containers to run. Um, and so we've got our container types, which are defined in the different services over here. And so the three containers that we're running are the GraphQL Server API, the Orders API, and thirdly, the Products API. And so, um, you can specify, as you can see, I've commented out over here, you can specify how you want this uh, container to be um, started up, built from a particular image. Um, in this case, because each one of these services has a Docker file in, the, in each of those folders, you could build this locally and get it up and running. Um, the context will specify where it can find this particular Docker file and then the, the name of the Docker file that I'll be using. Um, However, in this case, because all the images have already been pushed through to Docker Hub to Calvin's account, um, I can just simply make use of the image property so it will pull the image from there. And um, next up, um, you'll recall that we have three repl replicas for each one of our services. And so we define that over here in the deploy property. And another very important piece over here would be the networking ports. Um, we want to forward traffic through uh, from port 3002 over to 3002 as well. And so this is port forwarding, um, which is really one of the cool pieces with Docker Compose as well. It essentially takes care of um, a lot of the cumbersome processes that you'd be running locally. Otherwise, if you had to just use the Docker CLI by yourself, it manages a lot of that for you. And obviously, I want my container to, to restart on failure. And then I provide it with a container name. And I can also pass through some environment variables. And so this is very similar to what I'm doing with the others as well. There's not much of a difference in terms of I'm still using um, three replicas for orders and for products as well. I wanted to restart in the case of any failures. And the images are also being pulled from the same registry um, with this um, in, in Calvin's account. And as you can see over here, Swarm Services Orders. And in this case, it would be Products. And so this with the same Docker Compose YAML file, um, you'd be able to get your application up and running locally as well. And um, this is the same file which was referred to earlier that gets uploaded 
um, at the startup or creation of our infrastructure. And it's, um, this is what is used to actually deploy our stack, which makes things very easy for us because it bridges that gap of a local and a remote environment because we're working with one Docker Compose YAML file. The last step will be to take you through a demo of this application that is already up and running in our environment. And so I'm going to head over to the browser and I have already um, entered the AWS generated DNS name for the load balancer that was created when Calvin spun everything up. And so this is a playground for GraphQL. Um, if you're familiar with GraphQL, you can actually click on the docs over here when you make use of this playground tool to take a look at the different types of queries that you can enter. And so I'm going to come over here and I'm going to create a query based on the orders ID. Um, we don't have a name for the order, but we do have order four and we can get some product details for a particular order. I'll get the ID and I'll get the name of the product as well. And there we go. Okay, so we are getting the expected result. We're able to pull some order data. Um, but the important thing over here is that our application is actually running um, the way we want it to. And that is all this is based on these three different um, types of containers that are running inside of Docker Swarm. And we got three replicas for each of them. So we not only have our infrastructure, but we actually got to see the full journey and see the, our, the application running um, with the different services. Cool. And that's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed the full journey. And um, like I mentioned earlier, all of the source code is available in a repository. So be sure to clone that and make use of it the next time that you maybe want to do a similar project to this, whether it's a personal one or if you'll be making use of it in a team for a larger project.